So welcome everybody to the our webinar traffic flow theory and characteristics committee webinar. Today we are pleased to have Dr. Shopping Lee from USF with us. Dr. Shopping Lee has done his bachelor's in Tsinghua University in China and his master's and PhD in civil engineering along with the master's degree in applied mathematics from UIUC. Uh, he has been a, he's currently an associate professor uh, at USF University of South Florida. He's a director of uh, National Institute for Congestion Reduction (NICR), the US DOT National University Transportation Center. He has established the Connected and Automated Transportation Systems Lab that houses two L3 connected automated vehicles equipped with US DOT Karma platform. He has uh, been PI or co-PI for several uh, federal NSF, USDOT, USDOE, local and industry grants, and he has served as a member of the Transportation Network Modeling Committee and our own PFTC Committee of TRB, and he has been an associate editor for several uh, prestigious jour journals. So today he'll present us about his latest research and trade-off between safety, mobility, and stability in automated vehicle following control theories and field experiments. So with all that said, shopping, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rafe. And thank um, uh, Jorge for um, organizing, for leading this uh, nice seminar series, giving me this opportunity. And I'm very also very glad to see many uh, friends uh, uh, in the uh, participant list. Hope you're all doing well and thank all the audience for your interest. It's my great pleasure to present uh, some of our recent work uh, on the trade-off between safety, mobility, and stability in automated vehicle falling control. And we're going to talk uh, as both field experiments and theories from this study. Um, so, uh, speaking of uh, automated vehicles, you know, that research has been, could be traced back um, many decades ago, but if you look into um, some uh, relatively uh, early studies and when they were uh, inspecting traffic, inspect, uh, traffic impacts, and you could see that there were high hopes on uh, the, how automated vehicles could improve traffic performance. For example, in safety, predicted that that 94 percent reduction of crash mobility, capacity tripled or even quadrupled, and fuel efficiency could uh, the fuel consumption could be uh, reduced by 25 to 50 percent. So there were lots of good uh, outlook to these uh, emerging technologies in the past. And also, you, you all know that some of these um, uh, benefits, particularly the mobility, were demonstrated with uh, uh, closed track experiments that this is a famous one conducted by PASS. Um, maybe I move this. Uh, right, okay. And a uh, previous uh, slide was about, uh, you know, sort of pilot research and uh, some, um, you know, limited field demonstrations. But th this technology, automated vehicles, uh, already has penetrated the market in a rapidly increasing rate. For example, at in the year of 2015, about 2%, and it is projected the production AVs will be about 40% running on the highways in the year of 2040. Um, and one key technology to empower automated vehicles um, is the uh, advanced driver assistance systems and its longitudinal control is uh, uh, sometimes called adaptive cruise control which uh, uh, dominates um, vehicles 
performance, uh, particularly um, mobility. Uh, so many uh, existing vehicles have this adaptive cruise control or ACC functions, or they could be named in different ways, like uh, um, I don't know, uh, uh, autopilot or uh, or uh, some kind of uh, uh, high tech package in your production vehicles. I, 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 may, maybe many of you in the audience. Um, might already have this technology on your private cars. So speaking of the ACC, you all know that uh, um, this is a technology that uh, adjusts uh, um, following vehicles, following distance or speed based on the preceding vehicle's position, speed, and other states. So this is just uh, an automated version of uh, human car following. And if you look close to vehicles that have uh, um, ACC functions, you're going to see that uh, you could set up uh, not only the uh, target speed, but also the following headways. And uh, actually, the diff you could select different headway settings that will, you know, have give your different following distance from the preceding vehicles, which actually, in fact, is going to impact a lot of the um, spacing between two vehicles. And also, if you translate that into macroscopic impact, that'll be the roadway capacity or throughput. So this is a very interesting feature. Uh, there have been many studies looking into these technologies and uh, you know um, we will see we're particularly interested whether these automated production automated vehicle technologies uh, that are uh, already uh, operating today whether they have the potential uh, to realize the high hopes that uh, researchers and uh, scholars put in the first place uh, so there have been many studies discussing the, the traffic impact and the traffic char characteristics of the automated vehicles. Um, at the macroscopic level, you know, I just didn't name a few. I mean, I mean many of you in this audience uh, um, have uh, conducted great work in this area. I'm sorry I couldn't include all your study, but, but there are still some gaps. Most of the studies are about the simulation-based. Um, and uh, the findings were based on some assumptions that may not always been verified with field experiments. Um, among those field experiment-based studies, you know, rationale of the string unstable design of commercial AV control um, is still unclear. So there are some limited field studies, um, but uh, actually, you know, we, we didn't look into the, the very depths of the, um, the the insights and explanations to the, the strain un instability mechanism. Um, and uh, uh, commercial AVs often offer users to customize the AV fallen headways among different levels, as I just mentioned in the last slide. Um, and this is a very interesting feature, but um, has seldom been <laughs> investigated. From a macroscopic perspective, we know the uh, actually fundamental diagram or some kind of uh, relationships between, um, you know, road characteristics and uh, the capacity would be very important. Actually, I talked to many people from uh, uh, from the planning side, uh, um, um, you know. In, in, there are practitioners, and they, they have a uh, imperative need uh, to formulate AV traffic, especially mixed AV tra traffics, uh, past the feature. So then they could uh, put forward the planning models accordingly. Like uh, you know, we actually also worked with uh, state DOTs and companies to help them devise such models. But right now, lots of these models are based on, again, good faith assumptions. Um, and uh, um, and the, F, the investigation of um, 
is sort of like a lo lo lot of these planning models just as simply assumed a factor to the existing capacity, like two. Um, a lot of uh, planning models are doing that. But uh, the com comprehensive FD is a curve, not just a capacity point uh, for pure AV or mixed traffic, including HV human driven vehicles and a AV. Uh, are scarce. And existing studies modeled the um, FD with a really simple analysis, mostly simulation, uh, and with very optimistic assumptions of AV controls, just as these earlier studies stated. So, to uh, further investigate these problems and give um, more clear answers, we actually um, conducted a uh, number of field experiments, and we also looked into the data from a theoretical perspective. Um, and, and also, I want to talk about some uh, implications to macroscopic traffic from uh, the microscopic experiments. So let's first introduce the facilities we use to collect the data. So these are two lab vehicles that we have. Actually, these lab vehicles were retrofitted into uh, customized automated vehicles with our you know, own algorithms, but the the, uh, the 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 core of them were just the Lincoln MKZ and production vehicles that have their own ACC functions. So in this study, we only used the commercial ACC functions, and each vehicle has four headway settings. Four is the lo longest, one is the shortest, and we uh, in all the following experiment we use that. Uh, High resolution uh, U blocks and GNSS receiver to record the uh, location and speed. And the, it is claimed that the position and the speed are of a good accuracy. And we conducted tests over um, the um, pub, open public roadways during uh, times when the traffic is sparse, so we can control the, um, the vehicle fleet. To, uh, to follow the desired speed uh, profiles without being interrupted by downstream traffic. Um, so in our experiment, we have conducted two sets of experiments. The first set is just a uh, simple car following, let, let AV following a preceding vehicle. And the second set is like having two AVs following a preceding vehicle. That, uh, um, for all these preceding vehicles, either AV or regular vehicles, um, and we could control their speed via uh, either adaptive cruise control or cruise control functions to follow a pre-specified pre speed profile. So basically, the lead vehicle will follow uh, some uh, uh, profiles that have a stationary speed range and also transitionary uh, uh, speed the speed uh, settings. For example, you could start from 50 miles per hour, drive it for a while, and then reduce it the speed to 53, drive it for a bit, and then bring it back to 55, and and, and further drop to other speed. And we could have this uh, kind of uh, at the large scale oscillatory um, profile, but uh, you know, at macroscopic scales, you're going to see both stationary and the tra transitional traffic. Um, so here are the uh, like speed profiles in the data we collected. So these are two vehicles. The, the top figure is about two vehicles tests. The left is head headway setting. One is the probably the shortest headway. Um, the this one in the middle on top is a headway setting two, slightly longer headway, um, and, and all the way to headway setting four. So th this set is for two vehicles, and this set is for three vehicles. You know, we have more oscillatory settings, and we also collected the data for all four headway settings. So th this way, our intention is to uh, look into how different headway settings will impact uh, the traffic characteristics. All right, with data collected, we are actually ready to do some theoretical analysis 
with the data or some data analysis and build some theory upon it. So how do we analyze the, the data, you know, besides uh, just to, uh, just looking at the data with simple, um, uh, simple ways or methods, just to, like simple statistics, I, we could uh, um, actually build a f underlying model that uh, helps us understand the whole process, helps us to connect mobility and safety together. Um, and this model has a, a, a function of uh, uh, revealing stability performance of uh, ACC models. We actually thought about how to came, come, come up with this model, and we found that this arguably the most parsimonious way that incorporates safety, mobility, and stability together. So we, we have a, a linear model that uh, follows uh, uh, this, this kind of a typical uh, car follow model um, format. The, so, you know, if you know all the Kafala models, you would see um, mostly two terms. The first term is about location, and the second term is about the speed or speed difference. So we have location and the speed here. So um, let's say um, in this model, X0T denotes the front bumper location of the preceding vehicle at time T, and L is this vehicle's effective length, which may be slightly longer than um, this vehicle to add a little bit of uh, safety um, distance. And, and delta is, uh, I, I put it here as safety buffer, and I just explicitly build this safety buffer here just to absorb uh, potential overshooting from the preceding, from the following vehicles for safety concerns. Um, and Y0T is the following vehicles from bumper location. And this term, tall times y dot t, y dot t is actually the um, y, y, y dot, dot zero. I'm sorry for the typo. So this is going to be the following vehicle speed. So tall times y z dot zero t is a time lag gap that uh, is proportional to the vehicle speed. So at the equilibrium state, so the following vehicle will just want to maintain a time lag gap plus safety buffer from the a preceding vehicle. So you can see X zero T minus L minus delta minus tall times Y dot Y zero dot T is uh, that sort of like, a, if it, it is zero, if the equilibrium location, if the following vehicle just reaches this equilibrium location. But if, if, if the, not, if this value is, uh, mm, so th this is a, uh, so again, X zero T minus L minus delta minus tall times Y zero dot T and minus Y zero T is uh, zero if the, the, the following vehicle keeps the equilibrium location. But if not, if it is positive, that means uh, the following vehicle is still um, behind this, uh, um, is not, not to, there yet has not reached this equilibrium location. Maybe it needs to accelerate it. If this term is negative, that means this vehicle has already encroached into this uh, equilibrium uh, this, uh, gap um, area and it may need to reduce uh, the speed. So you, I put a simply a very simple linear control, proportional control. There is a coefficient to kappa that uh, um, that is used to adjust the, um, the sensitivity of this control. So the, the left-hand side is the following vehicle's acceleration. So this is a, a typical uh, linear control or car following law that is parsimonious and also that is consistent with uh, uh, the traffic flow um, 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 paradigm and also incorporates a safety buffer here so we can explicitly investigate how this safety buffer could be designed. So the problem, the theoretical problem is just a, for a given uh, car follow model in the above form, 
this linear form. And uh, how do we design a reasonable safety buffer so that in any um, circumstance, the fallen vehicle is not going to rear uh, up into the preceding vehicle. There is not going to be any collision uh, risk. So that is the, the principle we have to do this analysis. So that so basically, how do we design a reasonable delta here, reasonable safety buffer, so that whatever uh, reasonable speed that uh, the preceding vehicle uh, follows, you know, anything, the following vehicles will not run into the preceding vehicle, right? So how do we do that? So basically what we do is we want to set up this value to be um, – um, maximum value that uh, for any uh, um, reasonable trajectory, given reasonable trajectory of the preceding vehicles, you know, if if you look into the this difference, this difference is, is uh, um, just like uh, um, this difference here is uh, um, this term, which uh, which uh, which needs to be um, actually, if you look at this, y zero t is th this location, and x zero t minus l minus de delta um, is this location. So we want to have y zero t to always stay within uh, this distance range and not go beyond this bar here to cl collide with the preceding vehicle. Okay, so this vehicle, so if you look at the mass here, x0 minus l minus delta is this location, and y0t is the front bumper of this vehicle. If the front bumper of this vehicle go beyond this point, then the collision is going to happen. So what we do is, we just look into the difference of the front bumper of the preceding vehicle and the this target bar and the maximum overshoot. This is like overshoot. The maximum overshoot at any preceding vehicle's trajectory is specified as the um, minimum allowable distance that this delta needs to be set. All right, that's that's a rationale. Basically, the idea is if you <laughs> don't get the the uh, clear uh, logic, the idea is to, to set up delta enough to absorb any overshoot um, of the fallen vehicle, given um, an uncertain range of the preceding vehicle's falling profile. And you see, we just uh, set up some um, uh, constraints that uh, specify the initial conditions and dynamics of the preceding vehicle and the car following dynamics. And also we set up some uh, kinematic limits for the preceding vehicles, right? So we, uh, we investigate if the preceding vehicle speed is within a range and acceleration is within a range. We can, for any trajectories within this range, we want to make sure that this delta is sufficient. Um, so that's basically logic, and this is, I believe, is a, a you know, is a brand new model that investigates the, the safety component uh, uh, explicitly with the Kafolum framework. I mean, this this model again, I have to say, is not perfect. It's a, a linear model, right? If we use linear model to investigate uh, the system, that may be likely on linear. You know, there could be some um, up, approximation errors. If, if, but, um, you know, but we know that the linear model is probably the least, uh, um, the most conservative model, I would, would have to say. Um, Nonlinear error could only increase the responsiveness uh, to the, uh, like emergency stop uh, or ABS type of thing could only increase the um, safety and reduce the need of this uh, safety buffer. So in that regard, this delta is still a good estimate of the upper bound 
of this setting. Again, we just want to look into some uh, you know, first order relationships the, the, between um, mobility, safety, and instability. So we think that it is reasonable to come up with them. Uh, this parsimonious model as a first step and we can always improve in the future. So the nice thing about this model is although it is a very complex, uh, robust programming model, as you may see here, but we actually spent quite some time to look into it and we found that we could analytically solve this uh, optimization model. That uh, is rare for this kind of nonlinear optimization model. So that's also another reason why I wanted to start with a parsimonious pathology model because it gives you the analytical solution from which you can draw a number of theoretical uh, properties. Um, for example, you know, we we have proven that uh, if the vehicle's um, speed ran, speed the uh, uh, V-bar is like uh, the, the minimum, uh, um, is like the maximum speed uh, divided by the acceleration limit. If it is a uh, greater than center range, and uh, we can actually uh, formulate uh, the, the delta even in, in this simple manner. And in, in this uh, simple formula, we can analytically prove that uh, this delta is gonna, the, the safety buffer decreases with both kappa and tau. Kappa is actually the control sensitivity factor. Tau is actually the uh, time lag um, we set up uh, here. I want to bring you back and tau is actually just uh, this time lag gap. And again, the reason that we set up this tall is to, um, you know, uh, to model that headway settings. If it is a longer headway setting, probably this tall is longer. Shorter headway setting, this tall is shorter. All right, so we found that if delta decreases with both control sensitivity and the headway settings, which is, a, um, which is really interesting. And the decreasing trend is convex with uh, delta goes to infinity as kappa and tau goes to zero. And delta goes to a certain negative value as kappa and tau goes to infinity. Um, and uh, again, for this special case, we can see as the this value is still limited divided by a bar goes to zero. Again, delta decreases with both kappa and tau and the decreasing trend is convex. And you can see, so, um, the same, similar relationships. Okay, these are just uh, for special values we can analytically prove. For other general values, we could draw them uh, because th there are just a few parameters. We can just uh, draw the plots of the relationship between these parameters, and, and we can see that uh, again, delta is going to drop with kappa and tau in all these uh, cases. So that's a very interesting finding. So that means, okay, if the sensitivity factor is a uh, bigger that that means that the vehicle is more sensitive than in this control you don't need to set as much safety buffer also if the tall which is the following headway you know, or that you know the headway setting is smaller you don't need to set up uh, um, um, as uh, as longer let's say um, as longer safety buffer So we actually have drawn a number of interesting properties like that with this theoretical analysis. And also we next we associated the um, experiments with this model. You know, we just uh, um, get uh, the experiment data as we showed earlier and put them into this uh, Kafala model framework. And with simple linear regression, we could get the, this model parameter. And we see that. Uh, um, you know, the R square values of this, uh, um, uh, like uh, the linear regressions are pretty high. That means, uh, you know, this linear model, despite course, uh, can reflect the first order uh, information of the system and capture the, the critical information. Um, so we see that, uh, um, and we could uh, sort of plot out the relationships between tall and headway settings, uh, uh, and also, um, 
following head gap headway and headway settings, you, you see, uh, you know, it's we first want to verify that uh, as the headway setting increases, the tall increases. That that is our assumption, and it is very interesting to see that uh, the increase is linear. So that means that you know, in this case, that um, the headway setting one bar means um, a the 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 time headway increases proportional to this uh, headway level, and also the following headway um, gap, which is a, a measure of the same thing from the um, distance perspective, from the space perspective. So the headway settings are highly correlated with the estimated time lags and the following headway in linear relationships. <laughs> okay, now let's look at uh, the relationship between delta and tau, and we see actually. As tau here increases, the, the delta um, uh, delta drops, right? This is a this basically means I, I think I, I mentioned this earlier in when I presented the theoretical properties. Uh, you know, I, we predicted that uh, this uh, delta is going to decrease as uh, um, um, uh, as the tall value increases, that means if you keep a longer uh, headway, you know, although the following distance is longer, but you don't need to have as much safety buffer. Um, and also, uh, as tall increases, that the, the K or kappa, that uh, coefficient to control sensitivity uh, decreases as well. Um, I think this is K, I'm sorry, I just uh, call it K uh, instead of kappa. Um, so that is also, you know, consistent with um, uh, uh, the, the intuition. So if the sensitivity factor is bigger, so the vehicle is more agile, so you don't need to set up as large um, gap, safety gap. So these charts show that uh, the theoretical prediction are consistent with um, uh, consistent with the, the uh, field experiments, and that uh, is a very nice thing. So next we go to stability. Um, so because this is a simple linear model, it is fairly easy to analyze the stability. We can just get the System frequent domain transfer function, and uh, you know we can examine its uh, um, you know maximum gain over all frequency range, and uh, you know we can uh, show that uh, if this maximum gain is greater than one, then the system is going to be uh, strain um, uh, unstable. If it's less than or equal to one, um, it is uh, strain stable. So and and also we first uh, we show that in this simple Kaffaller model it is always uh, local stable. That means you're not gonna go crazy in this uh, just because of simple perturbation. But uh, the strain stability is actually quite dependent upon uh, this value k times tall square. So if the k times tall square is too small, then this uh, gain is greater than one, that means it's string instable, string unstable. But if this uh, value k times tau square is greater than two, then that's, that means uh, uh, this model is string stable. You know, we also solved the uh, critical frequency range. So at which frequency uh, or oscillation period uh, that, um, you know, the amplification of the traffic oscillation will be maximized you know, we, with this simple uh, formula. We can get all the, all these um, values analytically. And then um, we analyze the results from uh, um, by fitting the, the field experiment data. We can see that uh, um, as k tau square increases, um, we, we we have saw solving that uh, the uh, frequency, this is like the um, dominating frequency for traffic oscillation decreases. And uh, 
uh, this oscillation period, period uh, um, um, actually increases. This is the, the in, sort of inverse of the frequency, right? This uh, we actually do that for both high speed uh, test and the low speed test. So we we we've done two range of tests with different speed ranges, basically with this four setting. So the results are pretty consistent. So the results show that the studied AV follow model is uh, actually string unstable for all these settings. Um, that is, uh, you know, so consistent with what, what's being reported about in some other commercial vehicles, like um, lots of commercial vehicles. Right now, the AV control is uh, uh, string unstable and a, a small speed variation of the preceding vehicle gets amplified while propagating across multiple following vehicles. Um, we predicted the cycle time of the perturbation P star caused by the speed variation. We got those values. And then, uh, then we actually particularly set the lead vehicle's oscillation um, a period uh, consistent with this uh, identified uh, um, dominating period of range from, uh, for example, from 18 to 24 seconds. We tried, tried them, these different values, and again, we see that uh, um, we plot out the GAN, basically the amplification ratio of the um, traffic oscillation across the two vehicles in this uh, uh, platoon experiment. And we, we found that uh, consistent with that um, ex uh, theoretical models, you can see that, uh, um, that as headway increases, the the stability, the gain actually reduces. The maximum gain, the oscillation um, gain reduces from 1.5 all the way to 1.2. Again, this value 1.2 is greater than one, so it is string unstable. But you can see that to the um, oscillation period, the, the 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 amplification gain or amplification ratio decreases as the headway setting or the um, tall increases, right? So that Headway gap increases, and the oscillation period, the uh, um, dominating oscillation period increases. So we can see that as tau increases, the ACC control will be less unstable in terms of the oscillation amplifications in cycle periods. The cycles will be longer, the amplification uh, uh, ratio or rate is going to be smaller, the gain is going to be smaller. So that is the, the finding. So if uh, we know if you project it, so if you get the headway sufficiently long, then the ACC control could become very stable. Kevin, can I ask a clarification question? Yes. So I didn't see the headway setting variable in your model, so I got lost there. Okay, sure. Yeah, Maybe. it is here. It is tall here. How is the tau? Okay, okay, yes, okay. What we did is uh, we, we don't know what the headway setting is. We only have one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Right. So we collected the data and we do the regression. You see one, two, three, four ah, okay. corresponds to different tall values. Yeah, that's a very yes, good question. Yes. Right. And they're all a very nice linear relationship. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, and we actually are not just satisfied with the data we collected. We also tried to test the data that Downworks Group collected. I want to pay homage for that uh, great data that other scholars collected. Uh, so we, we tried to you know put them into the regression and see whether the results were consistent with our theoretical models. Again, I think uh, the values of for their test, they only have two headway settings, long and short, doesn't have so many different grades. But from that, we can see the similar uh, findings. The values of delta increase as tau decrease, which is uh, what our model predicts. Uh, and also the studied AV following designs are still strings, un uh, uh, string unstable. Um, yeah, if you look at the K tau square values, they're way below two. Um, 
So they're 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 still straight on stable. And as the value of tall headway setting increases, the control will become less stable. Uh, again, it's like long headway has a greater k tall value, so they're less unstable. Uh, so yeah, it, if you are, have more data set, it can maybe plug in to this model and play with it and see whether at least do some uh, general regression, see whether the relationship is true. So implication to mobility. All right, so the implication to mobility is very uh, straightforward because this linear Kafala model, you can easily uh, check that uh, the, the, the uh, traffic mobility characteristics like um, following headway speed and uh, uh, density relationship, right? So we can get to the gap, gap headway very easily with this uh, equation um, based on the linear path all headway and this picture. Um, and we can find that strain stable gap headway. Uh, we can formulate it. Uh, so that is a gap that is needed to make the system strain stable. And we can also, um, we, we found that uh, this strain stable gap headway is really long. Because as you see from the experiments, you know, even for the four different headway settings from the Lincoln vehicle, we could uh, not uh, make it stable. We have to make the uh, gap even longer to extra extrapolate the results to get a string stable control. But uh, on the other hand, if you vary time uh, gap like tall, we want to minimize the following gap headway P. Oh, why do we want to do that? Do that? If we minimize this following gap, um, that is maximizing the, the traffic throughput. This is a problem like the optimal vehicle gap um, that this model allows, regard, regardless of stability, to maximize the mobility. All right, we can. This 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 gap is G star, and um, we also e examined that. Uh, how this G, G under bar, which is the stable gap versus the minimum gap, G star. And we see stable gap, you know, if uh, the, the value could be really long for some reasonable parameter settings, like four seconds or above. And it uh, it has a significant uh, gap. Um, so the G, G bar is significantly greater than G star. Um, so that means, you know, if you want to have mobility, um, um, if you want to maximize mobility, then the, the headway setting needs to be much shorter than this uh, stable uh, headway. Um, you know that that is shows the trade-off between mobility and stability, right? If you want to have a stability, you want to have longer headway. If you want to have a better mobility, you want to reduce the headway, right? Um, so the stability gap uh, headway G under bar is too long. Compromise a sweet spot between G under bar and G star. You know, we we may allow some strain on stability, but we 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 can still improve the mobility, right? It, it, we cannot afford to set up too long gap headway. You know, and one practical concern would be vehicles will cut in if <laughs> you know it will, will change their lens to cut in if you keep too long headway from the preceding vehicle, right? AV makers do not, and 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 also. You know, some uh, speculations like heavy makers do not really care train stability and design gap header is close to G star. Um, and from our findings, so that means, okay, they, they, they want to um, make that, uh, make sure that the, the, the following vehicle can follow the preceding vehicle closer. And so m maybe this way the driver feels like uh, the driving is uh, more, you know, uh, more. Uh, Comfortable, or actually, you know, there is no risk of being cut in by others, or or the driver feels like it's more, uh, is faster. And uh, anyway, strain stability, the individual driver would not to feel that and its impact. Its impact is, it can be only measured by looking to a strain uh, uh, of vehicles, which uh, is not, um, as of now, a concern of AV makers. Finally, I'm going to just quickly talk about some implications to macroscopic traffic, then I will stop for a few questions. So we, we use the Eddy's equation to um, actually convert the microscopic measures to macroscopic measures. 
so we can look into the fundamental diagram related. To. And as a benchmark, we also use the human driven vehicle trajectories. This time we, we don't, we use a new set of data that is, uh, um, it's like NGSIM, but much longer than NGSIM. It's like about, uh, I think, uh, about, um, um, you know, we collected from I-75 of this helicopter and get about 1.2 miles long trajectories, which is much longer than that. But it can be used to extract a human-driven vehicle uh, fundamental diagram. Is that you available? Know, uh, yes, I think uh, if you're – FXWA is about to publish it, but if you want, I, I can send you this link. This is, um, you know – this is a project that uh, they have wrapped up. So I, I, if whoever wants the data, I can let me know. We can uh, share share this with you. And it's good to see we get the latest scoop in this webinar. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, we spent quite a lot of effort to collect the data and hope it can be used by our community. And and so all right. So the AV data, we we actually use the Eddie's, um method to equation to convert the microscopic to macroscopic, we can, um, you know, it, it's interesting to see that um, at different headways, you can get to different uh, um, fundamental diagrams, right branch. And I think uh, oh, this is a, actually a dated version. We added more experiments and we found that, uh, you know, like uh, the, the new wells, uh, triangular fundamental diagram works pretty well for, you um, automated vehicles, the, the relationship on the right-hand side is pretty linear based on our test. Um, I mean, of course, our vehicles cannot go to very low speed because they're half uh, not full-speed range ACCs. If you guys have full-speed ACCs, let, we could uh, collaborate to fill this range so then we can have, or we, we're going to rent some <laughs> to do the, some vehicles after the pandemic to fill this part. Uh, but they are very, um, you know, informative. And and this, these are like, like the Another fundamental diagram made by data provided by um, Dr. Denwork's group. And again, from this studies, we see that, uh, you know, as the headway settings becomes uh, longer, the capacity drops quickly. But, the, you know, that the jam densities are about in the same range, you know, given that we don't have much data. Looks like uh, that, that's, that uh, jam densities are pretty consistent, which is also associated with the de delta. Um, it's quite low, though, the gem density. Um, yes. I think in order to accurately predict this, I, we, we will probably have uh, some extra data. Yeah, this is uh, in terms of kilometers per, um, yeah. It's like 90 something. It's like, uh, you know, because because the AVs, will, once we stop, they will follow up each other very close. Mm -hmm. and, and the second data set is even, uh, you know, we do the prediction. This this one is uh, gem density is uh, even even um, lower, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I said it wrong. I, so the AV is going to follow each other with a sufficient space. It's pretty conservative. So that's why these densities are lower. But of course, we need to have the full speed range to see. Right. Yeah. And this is the data set that we got from the human, uh, from, from the human driven trajectories. Uh, and, and, and this is a fundamental diagram we extracted from the trajectory data set. And uh, we are actually just uh, estimated from the estimation results, we we got to the roadway capacities of these three data sets. The third data set is benchmark. It's like about 2,000 vehicles per per lamb per hour. Uh, but if you look at the, the values of these uh, uh, different headway settings, if the headway setting is short, maybe current AVs may be able to beat to the human dri driver's capacity. But the, for the long headways, it's even worse, actually. <laughs> From both sets of data, I, I think that, you know, that you can see that if the headway is short, so we have higher capacity than human drivers. Otherwise, we may have lower capacity. So, so as of now, the AV technologies are still, the capacity performance are still, you know, far from what we expected. They cannot double the, uh, 
um, roadway capacity, and they may even compromise it. And again, this uh, estimation is based on microscopic um, trajectories. Maybe it, it could slightly overestimate the road capacity, um, thinking that in road driving there could be some gaps and for land changes and other things. You know, we could do some further study to look into this. But uh, uh, takeaways, okay, the current technology AVs may compromise, even compromise the road capacity. Okay, and with that, we can actually plot, you know, we developed a method of using the rural data to come up with um, mixed traffic fundamental diagram, you know, based on the um, simple relationships between um, different headway types. I'm just going to, um, you know, I think this is a, based on pretty straightforward math and uh, the um, relationships be about how to mix different headways. We, we published the theoretical paper before, and now we expanded it to, uh, uh, to this field data. And the, the theoretical paper we had before was just about uh, the capacity along a single point. But now with the total data, we can get to the congestion range. And that free flow uh, congestion branch, uh, and uh, the first flow branch is just so straightforward anyways. Straight line, you know, it's not uh, of that much interest. So as long as we can con construct the congested uh, 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 branch, then, then that's, that is uh, good. All right, that is pretty much about my presentation. You know, I just want to leave some time for questions. Thank you. Thank, thank all of you for your time. Thank you, Sharpen, for your interesting presentation. I think you uh, we have set a new record for the attendance in our webinars. I think it will be good if we recognize it with an award in our next committee meeting. So before we move to the q and I have to make two announcements. So uh, first of all, we are looking for further presenters in our webinars series. So since there are many people in our committee here, if you want to present any part of your research, please feel free to email me or Dr. Lawal if you want to present in our webinar series. And the next announcement is that we'll have a special webinar next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Let me just share my screen. For a minute. So if you can see my screen, like there's a challenge KDD Cup 2021 organized by a research lab in China. We'll have a, uh, it's about how many vehicles can you serve at most real city scale road network. And the goal is maximize the number of vehicles served with the city while maintaining an acceptable delay. So we'll have a special presentation and this organizers, one of the organizers, will come and talk to us about this challenge and what it's about. It'll be good if you want to participate in it. If you want, you can uh, participate in the webinar next Wednesday. I'll share the announcement and this poster uh, next week, like today with you, but the webinar is next Wednesday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. So now we can move to the Q&A. If you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question, or you can like type type in your question in the chat section, and we can ask it from Shopping. We already have a question in the chat by Jack. Yeah, from Jack. Thank you, Jack. You had a um, you know had a nice ride with kids, and you were. Sending kids right now, but uh, yeah, the question is that I totally understand using a linear model to gain analytical solutions, but how uncertain in model parameters is integrated in a linear controller? Slide the 16. Let me share my screen again to reference the slides. Um, let me see, slide 16. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is a, or the safety model uh, starts. Yeah, sure. So and right now, we actually just used a uh, deterministic model. Again, we're looking for parsimony of this analysis. So we, uh, uh, maybe stochasticity could be something we investigate the next step. But we do consider the uncertainties in this model here. So the, the thing is, you know, 
how to keep this safety buffer safe? Of course, with different uh, following preceding vehicles, uh, uh, vehicle trajectories, we could have uh, different response from the following vehicle. But in this model, you know, we don't give some particular preceding vehicle pattern, like a, a particular drive patterns. We consider all possible <laughs> driving patterns as long as the preceding vehicle speed is within a certain range and acceleration is limited by a certain range. That is pretty broad, and that can consider any situation, any kind of driving trajectories, and we want to make sure that the model is safe for any um, preceding vehicle's trajectory. You know, that captures all cases with, as long as their speed and acceleration is for within this range. So in this, in this regard, we do consider uncertainty, although this is not stochasticity. So this is, so-called robust safety buffer model, RSB. Um, so, so it's a robust optimization, I would say. You mentioned somehow that uh, the linear model would be the conservative model compared with nonlinear. Have you proven that? I really believe that such a claim is not straightforward. Well, yes, we actually, we didn't prove it here, but uh, uh, we have um, done lots of analysis about uh, um, uh, nonlinear models. We published this brief-ish papers about uh, how nonlinear models could dampen the traffic oscillation development. If it can dampen the traffic oscillation development, that means you know if your speed variation can be hampered as long as your speed variation goes to above a range. Um, yes, that's a nice point, and maybe we can combine these different papers and then see how the nonlinearity uh, um, impacted. It's actually not that straightforward. It's because when vehicles come to emergency stop, the sensitivity factor will be much stronger. And it, even for our driving, you know, if the distance is far, our driving is pretty relaxed. But when we closely follow the preceding vehicle and the vehicle has a red light, maybe our response will be fast. But, but I mean, it's a very good question. We should, uh, um, we may be able to associate these uh, studies from different papers to look into that. Uh, why not to consider a PI controller um, rather than P controller? You still might uh, get uh, uh, analytical results, uh, but with more uh, realistic behavior. Yeah, see, car follow model are mostly PD. I don't think they, they have lots of it. Uh, well, you could say actually this, no, PID, you know, depending on how to you see it. And, you know, in this model already, if if you're a control um, accelerations, right, you, I mean, if, if you view velocity as the direct measures, then that distance would already be I, and the velocity is P, actually. So, um, but, I mean, you're, you're essentially playing PID this three up. Uh, <laughs> three things even for all these linear models, right? We just select the um, most parsimonious model. We probably miss a term that is speed difference compared with the general Tafolo model. Arguably that, you know, if you linearize almost, I think almost all Tafolo models we have investigated, if you linearize it, it will be this this term plus a speed difference term. We drop the speed difference term because it's complex and you cannot get analytical solution. And also from simulation, it really doesn't impact the safety that much. So we dropped it for parsimonious analysis. All right. Okay, so I'll probably use up all my time. Any other questions? Thank you, Jack. I have one question, if I may. Sure. So, uh, thank you, Xiaofan, for the great presentation. It's very interesting. So I have a question about the the measurement method. You said that you guys used the Eubrox GPS, right? At the beginning. Yes. Right. Yeah, so I'm just curious. Have you uh, tested the accuracy of uh, the measurement? Because we, uh, we did some experiments uh, using a similar device, and then we are really not sure about the accuracy. Oh, yeah. Well, well the thing is that, you know, this is like average accuracy. It really depends on 
the, the settings. Our test is in pretty open space, and I think the accuracy was good. But I didn't calibrate with the, uh, with other devices. We we have a really high resolution <laughs> GPS or GN navigation system, uh, like that device is about uh, 30k, <laughs> but we actually didn't activate it during the test. So maybe next time we should activate it and to, to calibrate it. But I believe that manufacturer, you know. And, and even for, like, if you multiply it to plus and minus one meter, because what we're looking at mostly at speed, the speed is pretty, uh, and we also look into the, the the position, right? So even if we have a plus one minus meter, uh, you know, difference, that's not going to much hurt the validity of this uh, analysis. Yeah, maybe right. you know, that comes back to Jack's question to add some statisticity and see how the results are. Yeah, or like that. But but we used the, the like the regression. You see, actually, pretty. Yep. Consider the the significance is really high, and you know. That, that's yeah, I'm sure. Cool. Like uh, I think your your results will not be impacted by the error mm -hmm. at that scale. Just out of curiosity. So by the way, where, where did you get the two numbers about the accuracy? I think these okay. are from the, from the manufacturer. Oh. The menu. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, good to yeah, know. Thank this you. This is probably in the best condition it tested, you know, when, when the manufacturer advertised their items, right? Mm, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it would be really nice uh, if we can do a little bit of calibr calibration using your highly accurate device to get a sense. Yeah, sure, sure. We can do that uh, easily. Eh? We, can, yeah. we can do that for some other day, maybe. Sure, we can talk more. And if That's you have good. any device you. that you need me to calibrate it, you can know the time. Yeah, that would be nice. So um, in your model in slide 16, um, I see a relationship to Noah's model, but I'm not sure. Have you analyzed it? Yeah. So that's why, yeah, this is a, you, you, you know, it is like, um, <laughs> I said I mentioned new world model. It is built upon the new world model. New world oh. model is like a, um, yeah, the the sort of like a, the simplified new world model is even lo lower order of this form. But but I mean the equilibrium, you know, many Kafka models equilibrium uh, form, you know, yeah. is consistent with new world. So it's model. like an optimal velocity model using new world yeah. congested branch. Right. But yeah, are, so this is more of an optimal velocities model, right? Yeah, but only in the congested branch. Yeah, only in the congested branch, but, you know. Right. Right, because so, car following is a sort of right. congested. <laughs> but you can argue that in car following, you also have pockets of free flow, right? So I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. that when you drive, even if you're in car following, there are instances where you are unconstrained. So you, you have the free flow behavior. Oh yeah, then that's right. not going to be linear. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, no, that's yeah. going to be more linear. And then uh, you know, it comes to Jack's question. It, it'll be just, uh, if you use linear model, you're going to say that the acceleration is going to go wide. Yeah, it's going to go wild, and, and I, I think go crazy. It's not going. We're going to introduce a nonlinearity to, to capture that. Next step, maybe. Um, the other comment I had is that, so it's kind of you're assuming here that whatever you tell the vehicle to do, he will do it with no error, right? Uh, right. So did you verify that in practice? Because you did experiments, right? Yeah, the practice is like uh, this. Our right. Series. But there's <clears throat> errors and inefficiencies, right, in the transmission. You know, at the low level controllers. Right. That? Yeah. So, yeah, again, this is parsimonious first order model. You know, it, it's not perfect. Right. So, I expect to see a difference between the theory and the experimental. And that difference should be the inefficiencies of the. Right. Yeah. So, these are some of these. And uh, yeah, we, uh, yeah, and I, I think we, we should, we don't have all the results, but here we. Right, but I guess my question is, did you see a large deviation from what you expected 
and prone not variation. Not that much, much. Not that much. You know, the 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 random zeros are of a errors are of a lower order of magnitude. First order relationship we show here. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I think Vincenzo Punzo has a question. Yes, I org I shopping. Uh, I would have a question and, and uh, on the same things. Thank you. First of all, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I did not understand. How did you? Um, so, did you measure the the time headway of the vehicle? Because you, uh, it seems to me that you calibrated on the linear model. So you got the tau from the was from the trajectories. Right. But you could have measured directly the time between the vehicles and also verify whether the hypothesis of the linear control, I mean, or constant time headway, uh, was was real. I mean, you could have driven the vehicles at constant speed, at different constant speeds, and measured the, the space distance and then the the time headway between between the vehicles. Did you? Uh, did you yeah. measure directly measure this this time because of course uh, I suppose you didn't know which is the true controller in the vehicle. Right, uh, right. Okay. So it, so maybe the, uh, they did not observe a constant time headway. Maybe they have a yeah, right. variable time headway. So, but you could have measured it. Did you did you do it? Yeah, well, I, I have to say there are a lot of things that cannot be captured. This this one does not have time to lay, but um, you know we have um, lots of time to lay and other things, not just to the Houston headway and uh, you know. But from this is our regression results, and I think um, you know it speaks that at, at least we capture the first order information. And, and what you're saying is going to be a wonderful next step um, that we can look into to see how. It deviated from it, but uh, actually, on the first order relationship, we're pretty confident it's good. Yeah, because uh, I recently calibrated several models on uh, trajectories of automated vehicles, and what I what I saw was that linear controller are not very good performing. So uh, let's say even though they are used extensively for uh, uh, for let's say for in in studies of uh, ACC. And they're you're as, they're right. as usually assumed, but <laughs> it seems a paradox. Yeah. But uh, more uh, old, uh, I mean, older car following models like uh, Gibbs model and IDM uh, perform much better than linear controller if you of want to, re to replicate uh, the, yeah. the, the observed trajectories of automated vehicles. Right. Of course. Of course. I. I... I don't discourage you from using more sophisticated models for <laughs> no, it's, it's just for this uh, study. Come. We're looking into the analytical relationships, you know, and, and I think this this performs reasonable and serves this purpose. And again, you know, if you have more parameters, of course, you can get better results. And also, the model is not linear. Right? I can assure you that the model is not linear, and we're working on to look into the um, nonlinearity of the, this control. Uh, yeah, yeah, but. The, um, yeah, I've been worked uh, a lot on that, uh, and I uh, published some nonlinear control papers of car following models. We can talk more about it, but that that'll be another study. But what you're saying is very good. Thank you very much for your comment. Thanks a lot. Uh, hold on. Uh, did you publish the results that you uh, mentioned? Maybe you can share it with us? Oh, yeah, sure. I, 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 you know, I'm kind of lazy and haven't submitted, but I posted on, uh, <laughs> so, so, so I posted the print, preprint to uh, online. I can share that with you after. Yeah, that'd be great. And also, Vincenzo, you mentioned some results. Is that published? Uh, uh, yes. One paper is uh, under review. Another paper, uh, I think it's going to be accepted very soon, so I can send you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yes. Congratulations. Awesome. Okay. Uh, sure. I, I tend to put the print, print, prints online so you can take a look at them as well. So we have two papers on this, um, maybe three papers on this, but uh, I'm not submitted on this. So the last, is, Dr. Thank you for a nice presentation. At the beginning, you mentioned that the real car experiments are limited. 
and the rationale is not clear. Can you give me more comments on that? Real car experiment. Yeah, we only have two, three cars, right? So we, uh, um, but sometimes before macroscopic analysis, so we need to look into traffic stream. We have to upscale that. that so, so there is some, right. going to be some errors. That's one limitation, right? Um, what is the gap between those SS experiment and the real behavior market? Uh, uh, these are, hi, Dr. Lee. I mean the stream stability experiments conducting literature, but not only those like we are just testing some market ACCs. That's one type of experiment. But I also see some other experiments. They have their own like, special vehicles. I don't know the details, so I'm asking if you know, uh, could you detail some differences of those strength stability experiments and our market ACC test? Yeah. Even for different vehicles, you know, different generation, different models, they're all different, right? And if you design it, for example, our OLAP vehicles, we could do something to make it strength stable, possibly. Uh, so, so they're all different, you know. I can just say they're all different. And it's like, a, again, I want to say AV, ACCs is not, you know, we, we should not just to focus on only, only focus on the behavior. We need to think about how to design it, right? We want to, human driven models are all about learning human driving behaviors, but ACCs is how to survive. Yeah. And, and I think the experiment in this study, they are using the Lincoln's stock ACCs, right? So right. we actually do not control those algorithms. We just control parameters. So I'm curious, do you know what radars those Lincoln cars are using? What, uh, I'm sorry, radar? Yeah, radar module, yeah. brand or, or year. They're using Del Delphi, Delphi radar. But we cannot oh, correct okay. the radar. <laughs> They have the okay. built-in, you know, we, we have two radars in our vehicle. There's any yeah. that shows our vehicle. And, right One is their and, factory and the other is uh, our customer. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And another question. So uh, I know we uh, try to fit the parameter of tall and K. So I have a question regarding the parameter of K. Do you okay. uh, happen to find K's somehow relevant to speed or it's a constant? Yeah, K, K is uh, relevant to speed. Let me see, show the results whether. Yeah, uh, well, K is like, uh, looks like this is a low speed and this is high speed. They are somehow constant, I guess, but uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, that low do not vary a lot to me. Slightly yeah. higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Very good. Um, I had a last comment. Sorry for taking so long, but oh no, hopefully problem. you don't have any meetings now. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, I, I would like to know your uh, out um, your look outlook of of this um, of these type of models. So, it looks like linear controllers. Um, have a strong legacy, right, up to now, but we've seen that maybe car following models do a better job. Also, people use a lot of MPC controllers to do the same thing, right? So, um, what is the fate of linear controllers or PI or PID type controllers versus car following or MPC? And also, Vincenzo, if you could uh, yeah. comment. Yeah. So, so car follow model, linear car follow models are special cases of PID control. They're all PID controls. <laughs> so, but some special forms. Uh, for MPCs, okay, I guess MPC is not about control, but about planning. It's more about com complex controls when you need to plan a whole trajectories. Really, the, the the key of MPC is not control. Is that that the, the work before MPC, what kind of trajectory you want to plan. Uh, and, and that is not responsive <laughs> type of country. You, you need to plan for a certain period of time. It's not to cough all in. <laughs> cough all in, this kind of control just reacting to the current status, but that's gonna plan for a long while. 
and I, I would say PID and uh, all those uh, uh, car fallen would be, a, you can view them as a special extreme one-step case of MPC. Um, and in regarding the linearity and the nonlinear model, again, you know, I always like to start with linear, but I'm not going to use linear model in my vehicles. <laughs> it's not going to be safe, I tell you. It's very, right. <laughs> it's very con uh, con conservative. If you want to make it safe, you have to make a really long headway for, yeah. for linear model. And, so, and, uh, and also vehicles cannot complete linear model. So what should, what, what would you recommend we use? Yeah. Any special a special car following model or extend this PID controllers? So that depends on your purpose. Controllers? Yeah, it depends on your purpose. What are you going to do, basically? I want to drive safely. Well, the car You want to drive safely, safely of course. Nonlinear model. And and we cannot do MPC if we cannot do predictions, right? So uh, th sometimes if MPCs would be more useful if um, vehicles are coordinated, they can share their more future intentions. Or for for those kind of like signal coordination, you know, those those type of applications, MPCs will be very useful. But you know, if you're just to follow a random vehicle, maybe some kind of a, like a IDM would be good or something like that. Nonlinear half fallen model that has been proven comfortable is going to be good. Very good. Very interesting. Um, looking forward what your your next models will be. Uh, Vincenzo, would you like to comment on, on this topic about the future of this type of networks or anybody else for that matter? Uh. Thanks, Jorge. Uh, I, I definitely agree with the uh, show. I would not uh, feel safe in a, in a car driven by a linear controller. But uh, anyway, so what should we no, use? My, my suggest Sorry? What should we use instead? I, it's a $1 million <laughs> question. Right. I, I don't know. But for sure, I think we um, have to study a much more um, uh, the nonlinear instability, and so uh, those. Uh, I think the problem here is that uh, with with our um, instruments of linear stability and all what we know about linear stability of car following mm -hmm. models, uh, we we can barely know what happens in real street because of course <laughs> everything is nonlinear there. So. Uh, if we think about uh, how uh, also uh, how to design and to verify those automotive industries very quick in designing new controllers and they don't tell us but we we have the, the obligation of um, verifying it and and propose some prototyping yeah, tests exactly. and so uh, we 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 have to uh, study much more the nonlinear the, the, the nonlinear part of the problem, mm -hmm. and of course, so either to uh, to dig in the, in theory or going through simulation. That is the easiest way, of course. Yeah, and we we proposed uh, we we recently published a couple of paper on on um, string stability, and we proposed uh, the use of the L infinite measure. That is uh, less less used than than the L2 measure, but of course, as, uh, it's more related to safety because it measures the the actual the the, uh, the I guess deviation on, in space, not the energy like the L2 norm. So you can use the L infinite norm in simulation for nonlinear analysis. So this would be my suggestion. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I see. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, great. And again, I, I want to, to say that uh, you know it really depends on the application for planning purposes. Maybe if you want to ask me the mobility linear model is fine, but for really microscopic control for safety, you know, it's a different. And also, it's your perspective whether you're going to design a make a automated vehicles you, or you're going to just uh, evaluate uh, automated vehicles. If you want to, let's say, do a reverse engineering to get uh, uh, the Toffolo behavior of a particular autonomous vehicle, mm. what's the most accurate way? Using near network would give you the most accurate model, I guess. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
guess it's <laughs> because it has the most parameters. Um, so it may be even better than nonlinear models we can come up with, um, <laughs> right? So, and, but but I mean, really, I, I have to say it depends on your your purposes. You know, it's, all these models are very useful in certain circumstances, and I think uh, next is. Uh, uh, any drill can strain stability enhance safety. Uh, you know, there, there there are two different things, right? Safety and strain stability. So of course, strain stability is going to help with safety. Um, you know, you you will have less stringent uh, safety requirement because as um, vehicle oscillation is not going to be amplified. Dr. Machindani, MPC and PID controllers can be used in a high practical fashion. Yes, sure. Yes, they they are. You know. <laughs> MPC, you know, it's really, it's a, uh, right, it's a, MPC could, could, you could say it's a planning, I mean, I really don't want to, to really put the, these different terms in different silos. Sometimes you don't have a clear order and really what, what we're doing is, um, you know, planning versus a control. These two things are, are different. I want to emphasize. But for this kind of a PID control, there is no no planning that the, the issues. Kafala model, we don't plan for quite a long while. But for MPC, it's like you could uh, plan for future. But there are some models that use MPC for the, the short term planning, like a second or two. Yes, but but they, they have prediction. It's not like just reactive. You have to predict something. You have to have a template. To follow. Yeah. In a, right. You have to predict the leader. Yeah. And sometimes prediction is different from control. There are two different tasks. <clears throat> okay. I guess uh, any other questions? Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank the speaker. Which, by the way, he's an honorary member of this uh, group since he uh, ran it for a couple of years, right? Thank you for that as well. Thank um, you. And you'll be sharing your, you mentioned your archive paper with us? Right, sure. That, yeah. Um, all right, so everybody take care now, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday. It's going to be a really interesting webinar. Uh, they're going to introduce, of course, this KDD Cup, but they're going to introduce also this new um, big network simulator online. It's, uh, it's probably the use very high-end computing power to simulate networks in real time, and uh, so I encourage you to check it out. All right, anything else, Rafa, that I might have missed? No, that was it. Thank you. All right. So everyone, take care. Thank you, Shao, again, and we'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shao. Thank all of you. It's a very nice discussion. I, 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 I learned a lot, and I have good thoughts about what to do next time. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good one.